Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We are back here live again. Uh, our previous one had a technical glitch, so apologies for that. So I'm re-welcoming everyone from throughout the world, our students. Why I said good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because our students, our network, our family is joining from the globe, where somewhere it is morning, somewhere it's afternoon, somewhere is the evening, and somewhere even it's night. So we are here again. I'm your host, Ashutosh, from Faculty of Pharmacy, Masai University. Here again in front of you with an innovative, a new topic, interesting topic on public demand as well, right? So today's topic, we will be talking about cultivate a mindset of innovation. I introduce you our speaker for today, Dr. Sohail Ahmed. Who will be your speaker, your host, your facilitator for this topic? Who is a rock star in his field, research and innovation? A quick information, quick introduction, introduction about him. Dr. Sohail Ahmed, who is a clinical pharmacist specializing in evidence-based pharmacotherapy, pharmaceutical care, epidemiology, research methodology. Further, he do have research interests that include self-management of chronic diseases. Chronic diseases, of course, you can write down this question. You can ask him later, no problem. Pharmacist-led clinical interventions, patient-reported outcomes. Furthermore, he have his experience in writing over five book chapters in international publications such as Taylor and Francis London, CRC Press, and over 20 research articles in prestigious journals, including Lancet, Respirology, Journal of Asthma, Value in Health, Nature, Frontiers in Public Health and Pharmacology, etc. Right? Further, received various highly coveted research awards, including research awards from European Respiratory Society, Young Investigator Award in Taiwan, Ice Force. Uh, International Society of Pharmacoeconomics and Outcome Research, Travel Awards for Japan, the International Institute of Knowledge Management, TIIKM, Travel Award for Thailand, Lung Foundation Malaysia Award. Further, he has been a bronze medalist in Bio Malaysia Asia Pacific Conference and Exhibition, right? He has been a gold and diamond awardee in innovation category in invention, Innovation and Design Expo in Malaysia. So you can print, you can pick up your pen and paper to go live with us, to ask questions from Dr. Sohail Ahmed after his innovative and mind-changing uh, session today. I hope so. So over to you, Dr. Sohail, and I'll give you the floor to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stosh, for your kind introduction and for agreeing to be a moderator of this session. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Sohail Ahmed, and it's a matter of great honor and satisfaction for me to be the, uh, to be the speaker of today's topic that is cultivate a mindset of innovation. In today's webinar, the concepts and the fundamentals of innovation mindset that I'm going to share with you. These are not my original ideas. I stand on the shoulder of giant. I have taken this from various sources that I have cited at the end of my slides. But the examples that I'm going to share with you, these are based on culture pharmacy experiences, how we, we have transformed the culture in Hansa University from teacher-centered teaching methods to student-centered teaching methods and how we instill the sense of innovation that has been acknowledged at international level by international bodies. For instance, World Health Organization, European Respiratory Society, and there are some other organizations also that they have acknowledged. Our students, they, they managed to develop a mobile application that can be used to assess the risk factors of asthma attack that can help to predict the risk factors in future the patient may expose to. All right, so before moving to the overview of my contents of today's presentation, I strongly recommend you to explore more on Hansa University. From there, 
on the Mahasa University website, you can witness how we have transformed ourselves, that our contribution is being acknowledged at the international scale. In the Mahasa University website, you can have access to have a look on various programs that we offer. It's not specific for faculty of pharmacy alone, for all other faculties also. So whatever the interest you have, either medicine, engineering, dentistry, pharmacy, business, hotel management, we provide a wide array of the courses that can be accessed. And then you can have a look on state of the art facilities that we have and all the teaching and learning activities in the vibrant culture of Mahasa University. So without any further ado, let me go through the contents of my today's talk. I'll start first by the definition of what is innovation? What is mindset? Why I'm starting by definition? Because definition matters. Without the effective, without the definition, the effective discussions and background, the build-up concepts are not possible. After that, I will discuss the comparison between fixed mindset and growth mindset. And then I will share with you the checklist for these two mindsets. And if you are in the fixed mindset, don't worry. There are certain ways you can move, you can do a transition from fixed mindset to a growth mindset. Followed by this, I'll discuss the steps of innovation, 10 traits of innovation, and then the most interesting section of my today's talk, it will be promoting innovation in the classroom. How we have transformed ourselves, you can see various examples from Culture of Pharmacy Mahas University, and then Second last will be unique value metrics. On what basis we decide that this initiative can be helpful or not? Because for Mahasa University, almost a decade before our top management started to work to instill the sense of innovation among our students. So from the top management, there's a trigger down effect to the lectures and you know, being innovative is a contagious thing. If your lecture is innovative, your students are going to be innovative as well. And once we, once we implemented these methods, what happened? This is the transition of our students. Their active participation and then their productivity inside the classroom increased manifold because of these initiatives. And lastly, I will discuss how we can avoid the pitfalls of the innovation. So let's start first, what is innovation? There are various definitions. Each definition carries its own value. I'll start first with the definition by David Berkus. The application of ideas that are novel and useful. Creativity, the ability to generate novel and useful ideas is the seed of innovation. Without creativity, there is no innovation. In other words, we can say creativity is the prerequisite of the innovation. Secondly, the introduction of new products and services that add value to the organization. If you see, all types of innovations are involved across two basic concepts. Either you are innovating a product or you are improving a service through innovation. Lastly, anything that is new, useful and surprising. And this is my favorite definition, short, sweet and simple. Anything that is new, useful and surprising will be covered under the concept of innovation. All right, followed by innovation, what is a mindset? A mindset refers to whether you believe qualities such as intelligence and talent are fixed or changeable. If you are thinking that all these traits are fixed, then you are categorized in the individuals who have the fixed mindset, whereas if you are thinking otherwise, then you have growth mindset. Now the question arises: if someone has fixed mindset, can a transition be made? Can a person become, change the mindset from fixed to growth one? How it is possible? But before that, you should know whether you have a fixed mindset or growth mindset. Fixed mindset, people believe their qualities are fixed traits therefore cannot change. These people document their intelligence, 
and talents rather than working to develop and improve them. Alternatively, in a growth mindset, people have an underlying belief that their learning and intelligence can grow with time and experience. So being the role model of the students, it's our responsibility to make sure whatever we are instilling, whatever we are teaching to our students, we should encourage a growth mindset. So there are few fundamental differences between these two school and two types of individuals. For one, those who have the growth mindset, failure is an opportunity to grow. As it is said, if you want to increase your success rate, you have to double your failure rate. The statement is true for those individuals who have that have the growth mindset. On contrary to it, failure is the limit of my abilities. For them, we cannot extend our abilities. We have the limitation. We cannot go beyond that. We cannot push the limits. So if someone is thinking like that, they have a fixed mindset. In a growth mindset, the person say, I can learn to do anything I want. Challenge help me to grow. My effort and attitude determine my abilities. Feedback is constructive. They learn from their mistakes. They learn from their failure experience. Failure is not a full stop for them. Feedback used to be constructive for them. On contrary to it, the individual, those who have the fixed mindset, they don't want to get challenged. They think their potential is predetermined. They cannot go beyond certain limits. They put the limits to themselves. All right, so let's have a look and identify which mindset you have. Either you have the growth mindset or fixed mindset. Failure is an opportunity to grow. Can learn to do anything they want. Challenges help them to grow. Effort and attitude determine their abilities. Intelligence and talent are never improving. Inspired by success of others. Like to try new things. Prioritize learning or seeking approval. Persist in the face of setbacks. Learn to give and receive constructive criticism. We are going through unprecedented times because of this COVID-19. And those who have the fixed mindset, unfortunately, they are being stressed. They have the job-related stress. They, they, they have so, so many different triggers of their stress. But if someone is having the growth mindset, they may take it differently. They may learn new skills. They may increase the inventory of their skill set. Fix mindset. Failure is the limit to my abilities. I'm not, I'm not, I'm either good or it's or I'm not. My abilities are unchanging. I don't like to be challenged. I can either do it or I can't. My potential is predetermined. When I'm frustrated, I give up. Unable to handle criticism or feedback, I stick to what I know, threatened by the success of the others. So you already have a list of few statements and based on that, you can qualify yourself in this spe that this specific mindset you are having. So there are few questions you need to ask from yourself. If you are in fixed mindset, you need to identify why you think like that and how you can improve that. This can be done by the steps of innovation. First thing, conquer fear by getting curious. Do one thing every day that scares you. Because if you have a growth mindset, when the situation going tough, the tougher gets going. Second, look back to envision the future. Discovery is seeing what everybody else has seen and thinking what nobody else has thought. Step three, understand, don't presume. The greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance, it is illusion of knowledge. Prepare to get messy. Mistakes are the portals of discovery. 
there is one fundamental principle of innovation if you are going to innovate anything in the starts it's going to be messy there is no word perfectism exists in the dictionary uh, under the umbrella of innovation so mistakes will be there definitely the mistakes will be there as i said earlier if you want to improve your success rate you have to double your failure rates every failure comes with a lesson and once the lesson learned you move to the next year you move to the next stage next last step foster an open work environment ideas are like rabbit you get a couple and learn how to handle them and pretty soon you have a dozen and once a mind being stretched by a new idea believe me it's not going to regain its original position so once you follow these steps then there are base, 10 basic element, elements of innovation mindset create curiosity analytical curiosity empathy inclusivity collaboration common vision courage experimentation agility long term commitment to innovation by the way innovation is not the destination it's a long journey so every day you learn new thing you try new method some methods will work some will not but if the method is not working to the root cause analysis identify the reasons of failure address those reasons hone those skills and then you can innovate yourself promoting innovation in classroom innovation is a process of creating value by applying novel solutions in a meaningful problems there are certain questions you need to ask being the lecturer is our responsibility to make sure we are promoting the growth mindset how we can do it can we do it by using the traditional method where the lecturer is sage on the stage and giving the instructions and making sure merely the information transfer that's it or on contrary to it we are guided by the side if we are guided by the side we will mentor our students we will coach them we will facilitate them we will inspire them to learn new things in a better way so whenever you want to do you want to make any intervention to promote innovation there are certain questions you need to ask before is it novel the notion of novelty is backed right into the word innovation if it if it's not new it's probably more optimization than innovation in other words we can say if i am thinking i am innovating something it's not compulsory it's true it may be just like optimization of previous methods next does it solve a meaningful problem and what the problem we may face if we are involved in a traditional classroom teaching maybe the students are not interested okay if i deliver the lecture i am talking to the slides in the first 5 10 minutes the students will be engaged after that then what do they have the same level of concentration definitely no but i have to make sure that they remain active in the learning process if not maybe it's art of instead of innovation that's not to say art is it valuable but it's generally not designed to solve a problem to us innovation is next question to us does it create value if not maybe it's an invention rather than innovation inventions can lead to value creation but usually not until someone applies them through innovation and now just have a look teaching centered student centered teaching methods that those involves the technology and there are certain methods for them if we don't have the technology we still can ensure the learning process within each category of teacher and student centeredness and technology uses their specific teaching roles or methods of instructional behavior that feature their own unique mix of learning and assessment practice and let me share with you the example once we started the new teaching methodologies from the start till now it's keep on evolving 
We are getting better and better day by day. We learn from our previous mistakes. When I started Flip Classroom for the first time with my degree students, Bachelor in Pharmacy students, in the first, at the first exercise, it was not really interactive. Then identify, you need to identify why it did not work. We need to get the feedback from the students, why it was not a success. And then after addressing those areas, definitely you can improve the learning process. And the time will come when the students come to you and then ask, sir, when we can have a next flip classroom. So this is a brief overview of teacher-centered approach and student-centered approach. Teacher-centered approach for certain subject has to be there. But in order to instill new skills, in order to equip our students with new skill set, we have to make sure the student-centered approach. So what three commonly used approaches we have here in Mahasa University beside the traditional teacher center approach are flip classroom, role play, test, teach, test method. These are three methods that we have introduced and implemented successfully and we can see the results when our students participate in these activities. In the upcoming slides, I'm going to share a few, few, few of the examples that how it increased the productivity of our students. Next, whenever we want to implement any new method, we need to weigh the benefits versus the risk involved. How we can do it? By using the unique value matrix. We need to have a unique method and this method should carry a high value. So if you see this matrix, our target is top right corner. High uniqueness, more value. The teaching method, the three teaching methods that I just discussed in the, uh, I shared in the previous slide, either flip classroom or role play or the third one test teach, test method, are they unique? Yes. Does it carry specific value? Does it improve the learning process? Yes. So if you have an answer to this question positively, then you can go for that specific method. Let's have a look on a flip classroom. Flip classroom is an approach in which direct instructions move from the group learning space to the individual learning space and the results group space is transformed into dynamic interactive learning environment where the educator guides students as they apply concepts and engage creativity in the subject matter. What happens in 2016 when I implemented first time the flip classroom for my students after receiving the, after getting the training by the external trainers at first time, the students were not familiar with the idea. And I did one mistake that I did not give them the option to select the topic for which they want to have a flip classroom. As a result of it, 30 to 40% of the students even haven't gone through the lecture notes. All right, so how we have corrected with the passage of time. So now what happens? On the first day of my lecture, I used to go to my classroom share the contents of my syllabus and then ask them, can you pick one specific topic of your interest? They select the topic, I'll provide them the teaching material and then I give them the instructions. If you don't understand anything, don't come to me. I am giving you seven days to prepare these lecture notes or the other teaching materials. It can be in the video form. And then after that, we are going to have a quiz. So how we usually conduct the flip classroom? First, let the students select one specific topic, give them the teaching material or the study material, let them study by themselves, maybe for seven days, and ask them to divide, divide themselves into different groups, and then do the group study. After seven weeks, after seven days, I will set the MCQs and then ask the students to sit in a circular fashion inside the classroom. 
I display the quiz on the projector and each quiz will be asked from the students. I'll give them some time to discuss among themselves to come to the right answer. So once they decide the answer, they have the play cards having the alphabets of A, B, C, D, E options and then all grades all need to raise at once the correct option. So once the correct op options are being raised, then there is a discussion. Now this time it is different discussion. Previously they were discussing with their class fellows, with their peers, but now they are going to discuss and justify their answer why they think that option was the correct one. As a result, being the lecturer, now it is my responsibility to address the ambiguities if they have. How we can implement a flip classroom? First of all, the planning is a must. Figure out which lesson in particular you want to flip. Outline the key learning outcomes and a lesson plan. Record, instead of teaching this lesson in person, make a video. A screen course work, make sure it contains all the key elements you have mentioned in the classroom. Then we have a pioneers of flip classroom, Bergman and Sam's book. They also pointed out that do not make video just for sake of making a video. Only do so when you feel these are appropriate and necessary. And based on my experience, it's not compulsory. You have to create a video. Maybe you can share them an online link. You can provide them the study material. You can provide them the lecture notes. It's up to you. And it depends on the nature of the subject as well. Share. Send the video to your students. Make it engaging and clear. Explain that the video's contents will be fully discussed in the class. Or if you're giving them hard copy material, then that will also be discussed. And one important thing, please give them the enough time for the preparation. Otherwise, we, are, we will be unable to achieve what we're supposed to achieve because of this free classroom. Change. Now that your students have viewed your lesson, they are prepared to actually go more in depth and even more. Group, an effective way to discuss the topic is to separate into groups where students are given a task to perform, write a poem, play, make a video. In my opinion, for the professional study, I strongly encourage the use of multiple choice questions and let them decide. And make sure the questions are application based, not the factual questions. If these are the application based, they will discuss. For example, I'm teaching clinical pharmacy. In clinical pharmacy, I give them the scenarios, clinical scenarios. And then once they start a discussion, it improves the team bonding. It improves the other skills that a student must have that we are unable to improve with the help of paper-based assessment. So this is the vision of Hansa University, we want our students to be assessed across various skills, not just the memorizing or remembering skills. And lastly, regroup, get the class back together to share the individual's group words with everyone, ask questions, dive deeper than ever before. And believe me, if you are implementing this concept of flip classroom, Students will be more engaged, they will be more motivated, they will be more involved and it gives you a sense of satisfaction that the initiative that you have taken, it has transformed them. After the six steps, review, revise and repeat. This is a must. Whenever you finish a flip classroom activity, it is strongly recommended to get the feedbacks from the students and identify the students who are not actively involved. Try to go do the root cause analysis. What may be the reason why the students were not participative or why that specific student was not participative? And then revise it. As I said earlier in the start, when I introduced it, I found that the students were not really interested. But once I started it, and then whenever I'm teaching to a new batch, I ask them, I explain the whole concept of flip classroom, and then I ask them, if you want to know further, I strongly recommend to consult with your seniors. And once they get the feedback from the seniors, their interest used to increase many folds. There are different ways of conducting flip classroom. There are few examples here. The standard inverted classroom. 
the discussion oriented flip classroom in the discussion oriented flip classroom you are not going to have just like the quiz is not compulsory to have the quiz is the discussion the demonstration focus flip classroom fox flip classroom the group based flip classroom virtual flip classroom and flipping the teacher flipping the roles even if you see the concept of flip classroom in the basics of the flip classroom means we are not teaching them we are just assisting them we are facilitating them we are enabling them we are mentoring them and then the students are good enough they can they can learn the things by themselves very quickly it's just like we have to make sure they are on the right track next is role play and beside the flip classroom role play also help my students a lot because you know we learn by association if a student has been involved in some activity where they they were physically and mentally involved in that is already a long term memory that's already in their long term memory so role play is a technique that allows students to explore realistic situations by interacting with other people in a managed way in order to develop experience and try different strategies in a sporting environment depending on the intention of the activity participants might be playing a role similar to their own or could play the opposite part of conversation or interaction so whenever you are going to introduce this methodology there are certain questions again you need to ask are there situations and interactions that students would benefit from being able to explore if the answer is yes go for it would live role play be most appropriate or would it be need to be staggered over a longer period of time should the students take on all the roles will the tutor take a role or can people with direct experience be involved for example having a genuine client or patient play their own part how much technology should be involved which tools are more suited what support should be needed are the students ready for this so if your answer is yes i strongly recommend you to go for it let me share the role play for my batch five students basically i am involved in teaching of pediatric pharmacy to final year students and then i'll just the first day of my class i display the contents of the syllabus and then i just ask them can you just pick one topic of your interest on which you have to prepare a video that can be used for the educational purpose so i'm going to share a few of the pictures from those videos and then you can see how innovative the students are they come up with their own ideas i just give them a uh, that what i need from them or what they supposed to do but all the other steps that they have taken and the final product it all belongs to the students and then it's it's really good really good for instance to one group i have given the topic not i have given means the students have selected the topic of pediatric seizure see what the student did in order to promote the education they prepare their own poster they printed it they learn what are the basics of designing a poster definitely if i am teaching them using the traditional method maybe the students will never have the experience of designing their own poster as a result they design their own poster for the patient education and then they have a role play where they were explaining the signs and symptoms of the disease see here and by the way this is our simulation bot where we used to train our students before they go to the hospital attachment as well as the clinical attachments and then these facilities these state of the art facilities can be used for internal student learning and teaching activities so this is just the example when i gave them for the first time believe me or not i was not expecting that they will be so involved they have various sessions they have 
interactive session with the pharmacist. We have a pharmacist, we have a simulated patient, and it, it really gave you a sense of pride that the initiative that you have taken, the students are involved in. They are in they are really into it by their heart. To another group, I have given the topic of pediatric ADHD. And then they come up with a slightly different method. First group come up with the poster and then they were explaining the second group. They come up, they have one pharmacist, uh, sim simulated pharmacist, simulated patient, simulated physician. Then they were explaining about ADHD. For another group, the topic was neonatal jaundice. What the student did, they went to a pharmacy, they requested a pharmacy, set, a pharmacy setting, and then they explained the purpose of this activity, and then they go to a real pharmacy. And each group has the uniqueness. As I said earlier, two things we have to make sure whenever we are introducing any activity. Is it unique? Does it carry value? If your answer is yes, please go for it. For another group, the topic was childhood asthma. For another group, the topic was RSV. And for this group, it was really interesting because the subject was pediatric and then what they did, they go to their childhood. They use some software to become just like minus 15 years or minus 17, 18 years, become a child, seems like a child. And then they were explaining all this. Then to one another group, I have given them the topic of nephrotic syndrome in children. And then they come up with their own idea. Again, they also look like a pediatric using different softwares, they minus the age. And then for one another group, the topic was given hand, foot and mouth disease. For this group, they come up with the breaking news. They want to disclose how big the problem is. And then after that, you, you can see just seems like a real newsroom. And then they have uh, one one student become a uh, virus itself. All right. So beside uh, the two methods that I have discussed, flip classroom as well as the role play, another method that I found really helped me a lot was test teach and test method, also known as triple T. It's an approach to teaching where learners first complete a task or activity without help from the teacher. Triple T is a useful approach as it enables teachers to identify the specific needs of learning concerning a language area and address this need suitably. Uh, so usually what happens, for example, if I'm teaching them uh, urinary tract infections and then before I'm going to discuss the contents of my lecture slide by slide, I just give, give them a short case study and then ask them. And then from there, I identify what are the areas they are not really up to. Then I'll just try to address those areas in more detail. Lastly, I have avoid pitfalls of innovation. There are certain pitfalls that we need to avoid. For example, forgetting the user. If I'm the teacher, I think whatever I'm thinking, I'm in the right line and I'm just doing that. Sometime we need to, not sometime, all the time we need to get the feedback from the end user. So I strongly recommend you whenever you give any intervention, please get the feedback from your students. Falling in love with ideas. Sometime we, we are so innovative. We have so many innovative ideas. As a result of it, we lose the focus. Where focus goes, energy flows. If you are out of focus, that's it. You will be unable to achieve what you're supposed to achieve. Seeking perfection. Seeking perfection is not applicable when it comes to innovation. 
in, in innovation is sort of own job training. Once you start, once you take the initiative, then you identify the drawback, then you address those pitfalls, and then you move forward. Ad hoc innovation is also not applicable. It's not possible. Innovation is a systematic approach that involves an integration. So it's not like in one day you will be able to introduce any innovative methods to improve the learning and teaching and learning and teaching experiences. It takes time. First time you will make few mistakes. Second time you will make lesser mistakes. Third time you will improve further. So it's just like a continuous process. As I said earlier, innovation is a journey. It's not a destination. So every day you increase, you keep on increasing your abilities and then you keep on moving forward. In conclusion, to succeed in a value-based education system, we need to promote application of ideas that are novel and useful, and we need to shift focus to new teaching methodologies that are move from teacher-centered teaching methods to student-centered teaching methods. Let's enable our students to learn differently. Let's let them teach how they should take the ownership of their own future. And then we need we will be there to guide them and to facilitate them. With that, it brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And take home message is dare to dream, be better, explore more, and be more. Yes, Mr. Ashtosh, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sohail. It was really an informative session. And what you talked about, mentioned about the flipped classroom, it was really, really mesmerizing. I mean, really, uh, we academicians in learning, when we suffer about thinking about some different methods, how we can make our students learn more, we have to think innovatively, right? So yes, we do think innovatively, and you really shared your experience very nicely. Um, we are expecting some questions from our viewers. I think uh, at the moment we do not have from outside, but, but I do have some questions, something to ask you. In flipped classroom view, uh, how about the assessment part? I mean, uh, there is still, I feel like there is some gap or, um, some more we need to do about the assessment part possibly because uh, uh, when it comes to learning yes i do agree learning is, is not necessarily to be by the book or on the board itself or you don't need a whiteboard or blackboard or always to have a book in front because real life knowledge real life learning is some, some more a big thing right so how we furthermore tailor it so that we can bring it into uh, our mainstream academics, right? So, so that our students can really learn more. Over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Stosh, for a very interesting question. And believe me, this was a question. When I finished the training, I was a bit confused in the start. Should I go for the to take this tool as a learning method, or should I take it for the assessment? But based on my experience, I strongly recommend in the start, please go for the learning. Don't put the pressure on the students. This is something new for them. And then the time will come, maybe a second instance or third instance, you may further extend it for the assessment purpose. And whether you're doing it for learning or doing it for the assessment, once the students know the basic theme behind, believe me, they will be even happy to go for the assessment. And sometimes it happens with me that students ask me, sir, we have an online, we, we have a MCQ quiz, and then we were involved, we were teaching for previous seven days. Why it was not assessed? And then I said, yes, we are going to assess it, but maybe next time, maybe for some other topic. So once you instill that specific sense and then students' in engagement increase, then you go for the assessment also. Because as I said earlier, 
innovation is a journey it's not the destination and definitely at every step we will make the mistakes mistakes can be from oversight mistakes from the students as well let me share my experience for the first flip classroom that was meant to be for learning purpose 30 percent of the students even did not open the lecture notes why because maybe they are not really familiar at that time this was a new thing for them but once i managed to let them know what's the purpose of doing this after that their interest increased many times and now i'm doing it for learning as well as for the assessment purpose uh, thank you dr sohail i think that was a very interesting experience actually because i too try sometimes uh, with the flip classroom view with some other tools so that it can be more interesting for students and uh, they learn more of course because uh, in my experience and my learning so far what we see what we experience definitely it stays in our subconscious mind and it brings out behavioral change far better than what we read and second in my experience yes in academics uh, especially as if you think like students we are uh, empathy empathetical uh, people so we and this building name is also empathy building so yeah um empathy wise if we see from student size definitely they sometimes or they they as a student they take exams or studies like they have to do that's why they do sometimes when it's get like so many assessment exams coming in so they just start doing or start thinking like for sake of doing we do it it gives them knowledge but it doesn't bring out behavioral change or uh, doesn't go in long term memory i but yes flip classroom also gave me very good results because students they experienced what they were learning right and they really started coming up with innovative ideas so why don't we do this thing in this way because these are the few symptoms that we can also cover in with the same time and we can relate the comorbidities or connecting the dots so i think uh, that was really nice session and uh, we had a good discussion too we touched almost all the points to my viewers i will uh, request if you have any question any query please do reach us below uh, below this video you can put comments it will be available as recordings we will try our best to come back and re uh, reply everything further if any time you would like to reach us you can go to masa.edu.my www.masa.edu.my i'm repeating again website is always open we have toll free numbers we have our faculty links you any time you would like to reach for any information from our side for any discussion we are open every time right so now i am thanking our speaker for today Thank you, Dr. Sohail, for being here. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Ashtosh. Pleasure. So now I am closing this session for today. Thank you for being patient, audience for us. It's a wonderful day, wonderful weather, and again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and goodbye to everyone throughout the world, our holy viewers. Thank you. Have a good day.